Did you hear the accent on that guy? He's the only person I could understand all, all morning. <laughs> so, uh, so 1997, uh, IBM's Big Blue defeats uh, world champion in chess. Uh, uh, 2011, uh, IBM Watson defeats the Jeopardy champion in a, in a task that requires very broad general knowledge and a facility with wordplay. 2016, Google's AlphaGo beats Lee Sedol, a, a world champion in the ancient game of Go. Uh, said to be an extremely complex game at that. Uh, these three anecdotes have, have two things in common. Uh, one, they are really breathtaking achievements in AI that really took the field forward. Two, they're all games. How many people here work in the gaming industry? Okay, exactly, a couple of people. Most of us don't. And so the quest my question to start is, how do we uh, translate these achievements, which are undeniably uh, really important, to the world that the rest of us live in? Uh, to create uh, value in business. And that's why we're all here. And I think what you've pieced together so far is that it's a journey and we're going to go on it uh, together. Uh, I wanted to start, I didn't think coming on stage at this hour uh, there was gonna be a need to talk about the definition of artificial intelligence, but actually after hearing the, the discussions today, I, I, I'm glad that I chose to talk about this because I think I, I propose I will shed a little bit of light on it. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the to uh, term was coined in 1955 by a computer scientist named John McCarthy. Uh, and he started working on projects with the intent of understanding the human mind by simulating uh, what people do when they seem to be thinking doing it. And so um, in, in researching this, this topic some time ago, uh, I, I came to the uh, understanding that there is no single con consensus definition of the term artificial intelligence. In fact, a, a leading textbook in the field offers eight different definitions and declines to prefer one over the other. Uh, uh, so this one that I'm presenting to you here, the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, uh, it's one of the definitions and I, I consider it to be a really useful one. Uh, note that it is uh, really defined in terms of what computers can do, not how they do it. So it's not um, about computers that think. It's about computers that do things that um, we think uh, typically require human intelligence. Uh, it's, it's a useful definition, but it's not a perfect one. And even John McCarthy himself, the, the person who d coined this term, complained uh, that as soon as it works, nobody calls it artificial intelligence anymore. And I think very much uh, that's going to be our experience with this term. Over time, the, the boundary between what humans can do and what computers can do continues to shift. And we will cease to think of things as artificial intelligence in the future that we call, that, um, that we call artificial intelligence today. I just want to mention that this, uh, I started my career um, in artificial intelligence. Uh, and I do trend sensing at Deloitte. And one of the topics that I'm tracking is the, uh, the evolving impact of artificial intelligence on business. So this takes me back to the beginning of my career when, when expert systems were the dominant uh, tool in the field and when, Lisp, when uh, uh, artificial intelligence researchers used something called Lisp machines. Does anybody know what a Lisp machine is? Awesome. So we have, I bet you're nostalgic for Lisp machines if you are like me. So anyway, uh, uh, my point is, is simply that uh, let's get some clarity on the term first and then we can figure out what we can do with it. So, uh, it's the field of, um, of making computers do things that we think normally require human intelligence. Now, for, for a business application purpose, it's, uh, it's helpful to think in terms of the specific technologies that have come out of this field. That's, at, at the end of the day, what we're applying uh, when we're building solutions to business problems. So I call them uh, these technologies, and you see many of the prominent ones here, I call them cognitive technologies. Uh, it's a convenient uh, name of, for the the collection of technologies that loosely fit under the field of AI. And they include things that handle perceptual tasks. Computer vision, for instance, the ability of computers to recognize uh, images, scenes, or even actions in videos um, and describe them. Um, speech recognition, the ability to recognize and transcribe human speech accurately. 
Uh, machine learning talked a lot about that, and the reason is it's one of the most dynamic and important of the cognitive technologies. This has been defined as the ability of computers to improve their performance by exposure to data without the need for explicit programming. Machine learning has immense promise. It's actually also responsible for driving the progress in a lot of the other cognitive technologies that are listed here. Natural language processing, being able to work with text more the way humans do than the way, say, word processors do. Uh, extracting the key concepts or the key places or people from text, being able to automatically summarize them, even being able to, to generate human-like text from, from data or other inputs. Uh, so uh, this is what I think about when we talk about sort of AI technology or the applications of AI to business, is the application of this family of technologies uh, to the, the problems that exist across uh, business and government. Um, and I'm going to do something a little bit different than we've done. I'm, I'm completely happy to pause along the way if anybody uh, has a question or wants to clarify something that, that I'm talking about. Or if you want to have a flattering photograph of me gesturing in front of uh, the screen, we're happy to do that as well. So um, the next thing I want to do is talk about the three things that you can do with artificial intelligence. I've boiled it down for you. Uh, I think this is another thing that, about which there was not a, t t a lot of clarity, I think, today. So I'm glad I brought uh, this concept as well. I've looked at, it and, and our team has looked at, literally uh, hundreds of examples of organizations in every industry that have applied or are piloting uh, cognitive technologies in one way or another. And uh, by the way, the, the side point I want to make is that it's hundreds and, and thousands. There's a lot going on in this field. And we found that you can really uh, cl classify everything that everybody's doing into one of these three buckets, one of these three types of applications. Uh, I call them product, process, and insight. Uh, and I, I mention this because I think it could be a helpful way when looking at the, the needs of your organization and the capabilities of these technologies to think about uh, where to apply them. So first, product applications. By this I mean uh, embedding cognitive technology into a product or a service um, that touches a customer and delivers an end, some kind of benefit to the customer. So uh, you could include a robotic vacuum cleaner, for instance, that might use computer vision or some kind of computer planning um, <coughs> software in that category. You can, you can include uh, consumer software. In the US, for instance, a popular um, uh, tax planning software package this year allows you to automatically enter your income and your tax withholding data by snapping a photo of your end of year payroll form. And it uses computer vision and machine learning technology to, to extract the relevant information and enter it for you uh, automatically. You may not think of that as AI, but that counts according to my definition. And that makes, that adds a benefit right to the user. Um, product recommendations on Amazon or video recommendations on Netflix using machine learning, those are also product um, applications. Uh, one that I really like that's sort of on the border between product and process is um, used by the Associated Press, the, the Wire News Service, which uses natural language generation technology to automatically write corporate earnings stories. You know, every quarter, uh, company X releases its earnings uh, report, uh, what its profitability was, what its revenue was, whether it was up or down, and they're pretty formulaic, actually perfect job for a computer to do, and financial journalists hate writing them because they're really tedious, unless something really special happened. So the Associated Press has built a system that automatically writes those. And it didn't do this to lay off the journalists, it did this to relieve the journalists so they can do other featured stories, cover big news, and they use the capability to increase by a factor of 10 the number of companies that they cover. So uh, delivering, by my definition, that benefit to the end, the end customer. So that's, those are uh, examples of product applications. Process applications involve applying the technology, these technologies inside an organization to, to automate some process, to make it faster, to make it uh, better, better results, to make it more scalable, to do it more cheaply. Uh, there's lots and lots of examples of, of this. We've, I think, heard some of them early, earlier today. Um, I have a great one from Deloitte, actually, um, of a process application. So in Deloitte, uh, we do some fascinating, cutting-edge things. We do things I can't even tell you about. But we also spend, literally in the US, millions of hours um, reading documents and pulling out key information. 
and you can kill yourself by the time you're done with this kind of work. So we figured out, because there's so much of this kind of work done in an audit, for instance, or during the uh, due diligence process uh, of an M&A, um, of, of M&A, we figured out this is a great job for a computer, natural language processing and machine learning to read through a stack of documents, uh, recognize and extract the key terms, payment terms or certain clauses that are actually the key thing that the auditor was looking for, um, to extract them automatically um, and, uh, and analyze uh, what we found. And so this automated document review platform that we built has uh, made it possible to scale up by two orders of magnitude the number of documents that can be reviewed at an engagement, uh, getting results much faster, more comprehensive, and enabling us to deliver better insights to, uh, to the clients. So great uh, example, tedious, but super valuable example of a process application. Another one that I like, um, I found at the, uh, at the Hong Kong subway system. Anybody ever been on the Hong Kong subway system? Uh, there's, uh, great, so it's a, it's a um, well-reputed system, carries five million people a day, it has a 99.9% .9 on time uh, record. And the reason it runs so well in part is its program of preventive maintenance. They're doing some uh, 2,600 engineering projects across the system every week. 10,000 people are doing them. And the task of scheduling all that work occupied uh, the system's senior most engineers on a full-time basis. All they were doing was scheduling uh, the work for the several weeks to come. So the, uh, the Subway implemented a, an AI-based system to automate the production of an, op of an optimal schedule. Uh, freeing, cutting about two days a week off the time that they used to, uh, to create this schedule and enabling the engineers to focus their time on other high value work. So it's another process um, example, a process um, application of cognitive technologies. The third category of application, insight applications. We heard about the, those from somebody else earlier today. So this is about uh, extracting insight from data, often vast data sets, unstructured data sets data that was beyond the ability of conventional analytics to work with um, uh, and, uh, and, to, and to apply that for generating business value. Now, one, one example is, is Intel, uh, which uses a machine learning based system to analyze its customers' buying behavior and to recommend to its human sales force who to call and what to offer them. Uh, Salesforce resisted this a little bit, being told what to do by a computer, but they welcomed it when they realized it helped them close more business. And Intel, just this one little application they felt was going to generate $20 million in incremental revenue just by making their salespeople more, more efficient with this insight application. Another example that I really like is a, uh, is a company that forecasts uh, the sales of retail chains uh, using satellite images of parking lots uh, to which they apply computer vision to automatically count cars which they then mash up with uh, financial statements published by these retailers and have built a predictive model that can map a satellite image to uh, next quarter's sales figures, uh, which is a, an awesome creative application. It's an example, by the way, of the kind of analysis. This is not a, about putting somebody out of work. This is a kind of analysis that wasn't even being done before because it wasn't, wasn't doable. So that's another insight example. Um, those are the only three things that you can do with cognitive technologies, I maintain. Uh, I also want to talk about, uh, I want you to know about uh, several trends that I see in, the, uh, in this field. Um, if you're looking at uh, investing, it's a rapidly changing field. It's good to have an idea of where, uh, where the field is going. And there's four trends that I would call out for you. Um, the first is uh, performance gains. And we heard a little bit about this. The, the field, this is a, an unusual field in, in terms of the the rapidity of the progress that's, that's being measured. If you track the field, you can find almost month by month records are being broken. So just last year, the record for the um, accuracy of automated face recognition was shattered. And now computers are better than people at recognizing faces and images. There was a competition between Google and Facebook here. I forget actually who ended up on top, probably Google. Um, and so you see this kind of progress uh, every month almost. Speech recognition, error rates, in recognizing speech dropped from 25% to 8% um, over a course of a couple of years. And I have inside information from an anonymous source in this audience that we're about to hear some other uh, improvements in the field of speech recognition uh, in a couple of months. Um, so th there's continuous improvement here. Why this is important is that when, when technology gets better, the applications for that technology get broader. And we start to see it used in, a, in a, a more and more situations. 
And so that's one of the reasons, by the way, that this is a, a really good time to get focused on understanding this technology because it's going to become woven into everything that we do, driven in part by the uh, persistent improvement in performance. An another trend is mentioned also in a couple of sessions that I want to call out is uh, open source and cloud. So uh, what I mean by both of these boil down to a key thing. Uh, they enable companies to get started faster uh, and at a lower cost uh, in this field. So by open source, there's, there's lots of machine learning algorithms and other kinds of AI frameworks that are available on an open source basis. It fosters, um, it's great for researchers. It allows, it's one of the reasons that progress is, is, is moving so quickly is because it allows researchers and companies to build on each other's work over time. And there's been an avalanche just in the last year of um, private companies or publicly traded companies open sourcing their proprietary uh, AI framework. Google's done it, IBM's done it, Microsoft's done it, Facebook has, has done it, released into the, offered as open source their own tools. So that's going to accelerate uh, progress here. And it's a real resource for corporations looking to get started. And on the, on the cloud, side, most of those same names that I just mentioned are offer cloud-based and others. Cloud-based machine learning platforms, machine learning as a service, if you want, which means that it's possible at almost no cost to get started uh, building machine learning models, learning how they work, and trying them, and scaling up if it makes sense to scale up. So we're past the point where you needed to make a giant commitment of, of servers uh, installed and configured before you could even do anything. Uh, and and this, this continues, this, this trend is continuing. Um, a third one is on enterprise software. That sounds like a tedious topic to include here, but my point here is, is simply this. Um, we studied, we actually looked at the 100 top software vendors globally, and we studied their product lineups, and we found that two-thirds of them already have incorporated one or more cognitive technology in one or more of their products. Uh, now, these are not AI companies. They're computer networking companies, or they're retail software companies, um, or they're marketing companies. But within them, they've, they've incorporated machine learning to uh, improve their fraud detection, for instance, or their um, malware detection in the case of network security. Or they've incorporated natural language processing to automatically process the survey results that a database vendor stores to attach an, a sentiment score uh, to the survey results that uh, a consumer has contributed. Um, or they include uh, machine learning uh, to automate tasks that you used to do by a person. Why this is important is, I think, two reasons. If you're a software buyer, if you're a buyer of enterprise software, it's worth start looking, to start looking at how your suppliers are making use of these technologies to improve their products. And if you build enterprise software, uh, you better be doing the same thing, figuring out uh, how you could make your software better by um, applying these technologies. And the fourth trend, something we wrote about recently, is pretty striking, and I don't, even, I don't think anybody really understands where it's going, but it's the, it's the migration of machine learning uh, from uh, gigantic, power-hungry, vast uh, data centers to mobile devices. Machine learning is a very computationally intensive task. Um, uh, it uses typically specialized hardware and lots of it, and most of the machine learning related uh, tasks that we've encountered, even if we talk into our phone, the real action is happening in the cloud. Your voice is sent to the cloud uh, for analysis, which is why you can't use Siri, for instance, if you don't have an internet connection. Well, this is starting to, to change with profound consequences. So vendors of uh, semiconductor makers are creating uh, specialized, highly energy efficient chips optimized for machine learning tasks and designed to be uh, included in mobile devices that will perform uh, some machine learning tasks directly on the mobile device, uh, even without a connection to the internet. It means that tasks like speech recognition and computer vision will work uh, better, even in, and more robustly, even in unconnected environments. Um, and it enables things like, it's super important for things like autonomous vehicles, and we're already seeing this kind of technology appear in the consumer market. Uh, we talked about drones earlier. I don't know if you people know this, but there are drones now that can, um, that using computer vision can automatically avoid obstacles without being steered by their user and can follow you by, by taking a picture of you and just going where you go, also by using computer vision. So that doesn't require communication with the cloud. There's too much latency for that computer uh, vision to work. Uh, you have that progress on the hardware side, and you also have progress on the software side, um, the development of optimized um, 
trained neural network models that are so compact that they can actually sit and run on a smartphone and process speech, for instance, um, or even um, vision without connection to the server. The reason I, so I don't know where this leads us. I do know that it's going to lead to some pretty, um, pretty new kinds of products and pretty new kinds of capabilities and new kinds of user experiences. So the people who think about user experience design, uh, this is a new area of great interest. All right, so you're here, I think, because you're thinking, where do we apply, where and how do we apply cognitive technologies in our organization? So I boil everything down to threes or twos or fours, I guess. So I have three, uh, three part answer to that question. And I call it the three Vs. This may be helpful, a little simplistic, but maybe helpful way of, of thinking about how to identify opportunities for these technologies in your organization. First V stands for viable. That means, you know, what, what works? What kinds of tasks are amenable to being performed by cognitive technologies? So these, you could probably piece together some examples yourself. Some these could be perceptual tasks involving vision or speech recognition. Um, uh, th they, these could be, uh, for example, surveillance or monitoring tasks, uh, recognizing handwriting, things that, that human perception is usually, usually applied to. Um, it could involve uh, analytical tasks or classification uh, tasks uh, involving large data sets. It could involve decision making. It's like, it's like diagnostic kinds of things that we see in the medical uh, world. Uh, or, or it could involve planning tasks, like we saw in the Hong Kong subway. Example. So all of these tasks have, uh, if structured properly, are really good, good fit with cognitive technology. So I would say they're all potentially viable, uh, viable applications. So if you have something that's viable, though, if you have something that could be performed by or automated by um, a computer, just because it's possible doesn't mean it's worth doing. A lot of people don't realize this. Not everything that can be automated should be, and there's a whole discussion about why that is. Uh, but one reason is that it may not be valuable to do so. That's the second V. So how do you sort out the valuable applications from the less valuable ones? Well, you could look at the, the human cost of performing them. Is, is labor costly? Uh, you could look at expertise. Does it require expertise that's scarce, that could be replicated by a computer? You could look at performance. Is it the kind of area where even a, an incremental improvement in performance is really valuable, for instance, in medical diagnosis or in financial decision making, for instance. Um, uh, or is it possible to use these technologies to create, can you create something that your customers will value? Not just new features like, I'm sorry, but I'm skeptical about the talking refrigerator. I'm, I, I may be proven wrong. I think it's a dumb idea. But there are other features that are really valuable. So can you create features that your customers will value? That would be a valuable application. That's the second V. The third V is vital. And what I mean by this, I think, is kind of part of the theme of, of today, is that increasingly, uh, these, the use of these technologies will no longer be an option. It's going to become necessary. It's going to be the way that things are done. Uh, and industry standard performance, for instance, will be delivered by the use of these technologies and no other. Uh, this detection of fraud, for instance, in the payment and payment networks is primarily done using uh, neural network technologies, among others now. And if you're doing fraud screening without uh, machine learning, you're probably not up to professional standards. Um, if you are, um, if you want to scale a process that is usually human intensive, like reading and interpreting text, there's no way to do that without natural language processing, sort of measuring the sentiment that's been expressed about a big brand across the internet. Uh, it's vital to use cognitive technologies to do that. And there's going to be a growing number of tasks for which the use of cognitive technologies are vital. And so that's the third V. Um, so maybe you can bring this framework into your own thinking about how these technologies play out in your organization. I am set to, to sum things up for you, really. Again, the threes, try to keep it simple. Uh, I'd keep these three Vs in mind when looking around your organization for opportunities. Um, I would also say, uh, and this, I think, really needs to be said, uh, start small. So we hear about Skynet, and we hear about systems curing cancer, and we hear about incredible applications, which may come. Maybe Skynet, not a great application. Um, but uh, the development of AI-based systems requires new disciplines that are not widely understood. Training machine learning models, for instance. 
the, the normal software development life cycle doesn't always apply here. And so the, the way to bring these technologies into your organization <laughs> is to pick a small application that's valuable and make it successful and get confidence that, you, that, that you've done that and build uh, support for going bigger in an organization. And I think this, this document review application that, we, that I described for you from Deloitte is a great example of starting small. Considering the breadth of our activities, it's a, it's a pretty ridiculously narrow application, but on the other hand, it was valuable. Uh, and we've built a huge amount of hunger across the organization to replicate the success with that elsewhere. The other thing, point I want to make about small, by the way, is um, I believe in production systems that use cognitive technologies. I mean, it's, it's uh, easy to lose sight of this. Probably a small amount of the technology in play is actually AI technology. And m most of it is the stuff that everybody's building and deploying already. There's, there's systems integration, there's information management, there's databases, there's user interfaces, there's all kinds of things. And so AI will, will remain a, a small piece of the overall sort of software footprint of any installed application. And that, that's important to keep in mind. Uh, and the final thing is um, get going. You gotta start now understanding. Uh, don't start now spending a huge amount, but start now understanding uh, to build your organization's uh, knowledge and your own. And find ways to incorporate the use of AI-powered tools in your own work uh, to, to boost you along the way. So thank you very much. David, thank you. Very, very insightful and uh, yeah, valuable information that you're handing out there. I'm assuming we're going to have some questions. We've got time for uh, a couple of questions. We've got any uh, hand raises in the room? Not yet. Well, I've actually got one of my own. Um, we're talking a lot about the opportunity, but also the challenges when implementing these technologies within a business. You know, given the range of companies you're speaking to, a range of different verticals that you operate through, are there some kind of common concerns or questions raised from an enterprise perspective of when implementing this technology that could potentially dispel a few myths for the rest of the room when they're looking at adopting in their own organization? Uh, what we're seeing and talking to the partners who are talking to uh, senior leaders at clients in a lot of industries, uh, there's, a, there's a wide disparity of knowledge about, about what these technologies can do and where they can be applied. Uh, and they've been, uh, there's so much hype around it that it has created a lot of confusion in the marketplace. Um, so the, the, just to go back to this document review application that I mentioned, that um, is not what, what customers think of when they think of applying this technology. Uh, but um, so there's a lot of um, uh, it's kind of education with clients that we're that we're doing now, helping them understand where and how to apply these technologies. I think that's uh, one of the big uh, the big things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great stuff. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Round of applause, for David.